Okay, it's 9 a.m. Chris, would you like to introduce the workshop? Sure. Uh, welcome, my name is Chris Schnepp. I'm the Area Extension Forester for the University of Idaho in, in the Idaho Panhandle. And uh, welcome to 10 Acres in a Dream. Uh, just a little history of this program. It was, this is uh, traditionally been part of our Idaho Forest Stewardship Program, which is a joint effort of U of I, Idaho Department of Lands, Forest Service, and a bunch of other agencies to uh, improve management on family forests. Those uh, forests that are owned by individuals and families range anywhere from 10 to a couple thousand acres. R roughly about 60% of the forests in the United States uh, in the panhandle here, roughly about 40% of our total forest land is non-industrial, private, or family forest. Um, this program, what, part of the Forest Stewardship Program is a volunteer program we have called the Idaho Mass Forest Stewards, which is similar to Master Gardeners in that they get uh, 70 hours of training and they do various forms of volunteer outreach and really are, have become um, our primary advisory committee in terms of giving us guidance on types of programs and we do and, and helping us to put them on. And uh, nowhere is that in more evidence that in, is within the design and development of this, this program. Uh, some of our volunteers, most of our mass forest stewards are our forest owners. Um, and they really thought it was important we have something to reach out to people who are new to owning rural land and, and really just don't um, have even a good initial understanding of, of the practicalities of living in rural areas and, um, and even drawing some of their sustenance and stuff from, um, from their property and all. So we had a, a three or four mass forest stewards and, and uh, Jennifer Jensen and I got together for a uh, afternoon meet, a couple afternoon meetings and had a visit about, you know, what a program might look like. And uh, so we, what we ended up with was a one day program that integrated uh, general rural ownership uh, issues. You know, even things, questions like how do you, if you're fresh off the boat from another state, you know, how do you make contact with your neighbors and engage them and things like that. Uh, so we have, we have some of that. Uh, have some, some basic uh, forestry, uh, some basic crops, and some basic animal science kind of things for people that have livestock. And uh, so that was a program we did about three years. We've done it as a one day uh, everything kind of in-person uh, program. Uh, but this year because of COVID, um, you know, we try, decided to try something different and do it uh, online. So we split it up into three pieces. The first part was on uh, kind of forestry in general, rural ownership kind of stuff. The second session was on crops and the third is on animal science and um, or, or raising a few livestock, be less formal about it. Um, so uh, it's been an adventure. We really appreciate uh, working with our small farms folks and everything to offer this in this format. They have more experience with with the, uh, the Zoom programming than, than we do. And um, welcome to the program. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, this is Kate Painter. Uh, so I was involved with a one day workshop and did uh, more of the livestock production in the past. Um, this, this time as we split this up, uh, we are bringing in some, some other people to do more parts of this and it's been great. Sometimes there's a silver lining to um, make our pro program broader and more accessible and free. If you've got internet, we're doing this in this three-part workshop. So um, I'm gonna talk about the schedule for the day. So today is the production management and, and livestock production and management intensive grazing. I just want to remind everybody that we have lots of uh, wonderful sponsorship, Idaho Forest Stewards, Western SARE, um, UVI Extension, and Cultivating Success. And we really appreciate the help of Cultivating Success. It's a small farms education program because they uh, have a lot of experience with this technology. So we have a big thank you to Colette Phelps and Mackenzie for, um, for helping us and being our technological assistance. Okay, so today's agenda looks like this. Um, I'm going to let Colette talk about the webinar tips in just a moment. And then Rebecca Mills, who's an extension educator in Southern Idaho, 
will give an overview of livestock species at 9.10, or we're just a, maybe a couple minutes behind when we get there. And at 9.45, Samantha Ball, another extension educator in Southern Idaho, will talk about pasture-based livestock systems and fencing. Then we will have a break at 10.20, um, and so you can look forward to that and come right back at 1030 for management intensive grazing and silvopasture with Tess Hahn, who is an Idaho forest steward. Um, and at the very end, we'll have a group discussion on rural living and question and answer session. And that uh, can go for as long as we need. It can go up till noon um, Pacific time or one o'clock mountain time if, if we had that much um, discussion. So thanks so much. and. Um, here are our presenters showing pictures. I should have had that up. Rebecca is with Gem in Boise counties. Samantha Ball is with Canyon County. And Tess Hahn is right here in Kokolala. Colette, do you want to um, give the tips? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this third session of 10 Acres in a Dream. We are all sharing a lot of bandwidth right now, and it may be helpful to you to close all the other programs that are running on your computer. I've also found that it's helpful for me to take my iPhone or other technology that I have in the house off of Wi-Fi to get the best bandwidth for webinars. If you are ever having sound problems, so it's getting garbly, elongated, you can go ahead and type into the chat box. We will let you know if that's on your side or if that's on the side of the speaker. If it is a problem with your bandwidth, you can always switch to the telephone. A call-in number was provided in your welcome email. And if you do switch to the phone, you can keep your computer video on, but just go ahead and mute your computer sound when you use the phone to avoid getting feedback. Please type questions in for the speakers into the Q&A box. You can do that as they are presenting. We'll be able to go back and make sure that we're answering those questions if they haven't been addressed in the presentation already. It's really helpful if you can do that as they come up because it makes the Q&A session much smoother and more dynamic. Again, you can chat in the chat box for technical issues and troubleshooting but also you can talk to other participants through that medium. So we encourage you to use that as well. This is being recorded and a recording will be available on the 10 Acres and a Dream webpage. And Mackenzie will be sending out reminders of the link to that specific webpage. We'll also have a copy of the slides up on that webpage so you don't have to worry about writing that information down. So those are my tips for this morning. Thank you again for joining us. And I'm really excited to hear the presentations today and learn along with you. So with that, I'll hand it back over to the speakers. And again, type into the chat if you have any questions or need assistance. Okay, go ahead, Rebecca. Okay, my slide should be up. Can we get a, a head nod or a thumbs up from the crowd? They yeah. are up and they just need to go into there we go. slideshow mode. There we go. All right. Go. And can you hear me all right? Yes, your volume is excellent. Perfect. So to get started, before we get started, I, um, if you can still see me, I know it's depending on the, how your thing is set up, um, I, I want to draw attention to, the, to my virtual background today. That's the view from my 10 acres in a dream, I guess. Uh, it's actually 8.79 acres, but close enough. And the, I live in Horseshoe Bend, Idaho, so if any if you've traveled in the area, headed to the hills or to the city, the, the, you might come through our town and, and um, feel blessed to be in that part of the world and feel like I have learned a lot in this group, even for my own situation. So um, before I get jump into my content, one thing I, want, I would like people to do is to uh, put into the chat. So I consider myself a lover of all things ag and I get ridiculously excited to talk about livestock 
because I really love animal science and I love livestock and I love talking about them and learning about them. So I would like you to type into the chat, if you could have one type of livestock as a pet, not to eat, not to sell, not for any other reason, but companionship, what livestock species would it be? So if you could have any livestock as a pet, not to eat, sell, or for any other reason but companionship, what livestock would it be? I'm gonna pull up the chat so I can see some of those come in. And uh, as you're typing those in, I uh, draw attention a little bit to my, my first slide here. These are all, these pictures are all of the animals that we have raised, um, my husband and I, on um, different properties where we've lived, but uh, we've dabbled a little bit in all different kinds. And it's, it's awesome, I think. It's really awesome. I guess I can't see the chat. Why can't I see the chat? Um, there it goes. Scottish Highland cattle, awesome. Robert, goats, sheep, goats, milk goats, pigs, love it. Ooh, bees. Ooh, a yak. Love it. Oh, donkey. I may have a neighbor that has a mini donkey. He got out one time and I helped put it back in and I wanted to take it home. Yeah, choosing one is difficult. I agree. Oh, we got another donkey boat and a llama named Dolly. I love it. The Dolly Llama. Very nice, Chris. Very nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for participating in that. I just get so excited to talk about livestock. And as I said, these are some of the things that I've raised on, in, my, in my home. And we're going to talk about uh, pros and cons of, of several different species today. You, things that you may or may not thought you know, you might think, oh, I don't, I don't want to have pigs at all, or I don't want, I'm not interested in goats. They wouldn't fit with my, my plan. Well, maybe you might learn something today that might spark your interest in a species you might not have thought to have, but uh, we're just going to go through this a little bit. All right, some general topics that we're going to talk about with all the species and things that you want to consider when you are thinking about adding livestock into your small acreage. Uh, we want to think about the space that's needed. You're going to think about the end product that's created by that species if you're if you're wanting more than companionship but if you just want companionship that's okay too and uh, you're also going to think about what it's going to cost you to get into that enterprise and then maintain that enterprise successfully if you are in in it to make a little bit of money which a lot of people are then you want to figure out how you're going to market the end product whatever that end product might be and with each of the species we'll talk about what those end products can be. And there's also, you know, what labor and equipment are required. You might have this great big dream of having this beautiful red barn and end up with a tarp over a, some old panels you bought on Craigslist. Just understanding your expectations there. And when adding livestock, think about what kind of labor is required, what kind of equipment is required. Are you going to need the big tractor? Can you handle it with a wheelbarrow? What, can, what are the things you're going to need in addition to the actual livestock themselves. What care do the livestock need themselves so that they can be healthy and because we, we want to produce healthy animals so that we can um, have quality products to sell, right? So, and if you're also thinking about, okay, if I'm going to have chickens, what else can you know, I integrate with my chickens that can dovetail together? And if you've been in the other classes today, our first, our first, our other classes in this series, the first series, first class, excuse me, uh, the presenter did a really great job of showing how his enterprises work together. So that's, that's what I mean by integrating with other prizes, enterprises. These are the species that we're going to talk about today. And I have them ordered from like smallest to largest in size, just because that might also make a difference in your management ability. So we're going to talk about rabbits and poultry, sheep and goats, and then pigs and cattle. All right, jumping right into rabbits. So what can you use rabbits for? Rabbits can be raised for several different reasons. You can raise them for meat, for fiber, for breeding stock, and for just as pets. And these slides are all going to be available to you. So don't feel like you need to make mad notes. Um, I'm going to be sharing mostly what's on the slides and then maybe a little bit uh, in addition to that. So thinking about rabbits, rabbits are pretty easy to get into and they're relatively inexpensive. They have minimal needs when it comes to housing and space that you need to have to be able to successfully have a rabbit enterprise. 
they're very productive. <laughs> and you, if you're not careful, you could have a whole lot more than you're expecting. But the, uh, to be able to produce a, a product out of a rabbit, you could be in the business pretty quick. And pretty quick turnaround too for a meat rabbit to be able to only have the gestation last a month and then be able to actually harvest your product within three months after that. That's a, that's means you could have a, a crop a couple times a year or on a rotational basis every week if you wanted to. And there is a demand for breeding and pet rabbits depending on your location. And that's something you would want to figure out before you ever started. Okay, what is the demand for my for this product locally? Am I seeing lots of ads for them on Craigslist? Am I seeing lots of ads for people selling things on Craigslist? Uh, or any local market that you might, might access? I'm not endorsing Craigslist. I shouldn't say that. Um, all right, so thinking about the cons, you know, that uh, prolific reproduction might become a challenge if you don't have a steady market for the meat that you're producing. And if you are selling the meat, it will be imperative that you find how you're going to process them. If you, there is a likelihood that you'll need to do your own processing. Are you prepared for that? Are you, do you have the stomach for that? Do you, ha, uh, do you have the skills and the knowledge, the tools, those kind of things. And if you're selling um, fleeces, you're selling fiber, rabbit fiber, it's really important to know about the ins and outs of that fiber because you're going to be selling to people who know the ins and outs of that fiber. So it's, it's really important that you have some knowledge before going into that. And of course, uh, rabbits are vulnerable to predators. And so you'll want to take that into consideration when you're building your pens and providing the housing. All right, next up, I, I like to tell people that poultry are often the, the gateway livestock. Uh, that you get some chickens and then you're like, oh, well now I need this and now I need this and now I'm going to quit my job and, and live off the land and because I started with chickens. And uh, you can raise chickens for or poultry for lots of different purposes. There's all, um, not lots, but the meat and the eggs. But the variety of the species that you can raise is pretty awesome. Thinking about chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, quite a variety of personality. If you're one thing I love about my chickens is the personalities that they have and just watching them is pretty entertaining. So chickens are pretty also ex easy and inexpensive to get into. Minimal land required and housing can be minimal as well. Something that you could easily build yourself. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Although you can get some pretty um, awesome chicken coop plans if you're a Pinterest junkie like myself. And a great thing about chickens is they're walking fertilizers, right? So they can improve the soil and help control parasites, especially if you're using them integrated with other systems. So if you have sheep or cattle and you turn the, the chickens out after the larger livestock go through a pasture, they can help um, improve the soil and help with the parasite control. Another great thing about poultry is that they don't have to be always um, caged up and, and fed a ration for their entire diet. They can be turned out on, on pasture and that can cover up to 30% of their, of their needs and their feed. Meat birds is a pretty quick turnaround, similar to the rabbits, uh, fast, depending on the, on the breed, 18, eight to 24 week turnaround for meat birds. And it's a popular product, right? Nearly everyone eats eggs or poultry. So finding customers could be relatively easy to do. As far as the cons for the, for the poultry, there's could be some uh, significant labor involved. So in the meat birds, every day, you're making sure that you're feeding them and you're, um, if they're on pasture, you're moving them. And, but that's again, a short period of time. With egg layers, Every day there's some maintenance involved of checking for the eggs, gathering the eggs, making sure their uh, water and feed is, is sufficient. And if you're thinking you wanna do some pasture poultry, you know that you will need to have some grains to supplement that pasture. And again, just like with the rabbits, what are you gonna do about the processing of the meat? So do you have a processor nearby? Is it a USDA processor where they can you can then sell the meat or are you selling chickens and you have to and somebody else is going to have to process them or do you have to process them yourself those are all details you want to work out before you order 100 meat birds 
from a company in the Midwest to show up in your mailbox the next day. And I love this last con. Everybody loves poultry. Wait, I thought that was a pro. Yeah, everybody, including bears and raccoons and skunks and weasels, coyotes, dogs, hawks. Yeah, so it's really important that you are providing for the protection and the safety of your, of your poultry. Next on up the chain is goats. So goats can be raised for meat, milk, fiber, breeding stock, and pets. Goats are hilarious and so much fun. And they are also prolific. They can have multiple kids at a time. And their gestation is relatively short as well, a five month gestation. And the kids, the babies, baby goats, can reach their market weight in a relatively short amount of time as well, six to eight months. And that can totally be done through staying on their mother's milk and then being on good quality pasture. So thinking about what inputs you might need, you not necessarily have to buy grain to uh, finish your goats if you have access to good quality pasture. So there is also the, a growing market for byproducts of goat milk. So thinking about um, milk, having milking goats and then producing some cheese or selling the milk to uh, your, in your local area. And then of course there is the option for fiber and again like fiber with the rabbits you can directly sell that to people who are looking for fiber for hand spinning and uh, those kind of things you just really want to know um, about that market and about your product so that you can be the most successful in marketing it the cons to the goats, so uh, they are Houdinis when it comes to trying to get out of things. But so, so you'll want to make sure you have excellent fencing. And goats can be trained to an electric fence. So if you have a taller, taller wire panels or a taller fence, and then you can reinforce that with an electric mesh near the bottom, uh, then that'll really help, your, help you be able to keep your goats where you want them to be. If you're going to explore the dairy option with goats, you'll, you'll need to have facilities that can be uh, really kept clean so that you can meet the legal requirements for selling that product. And like I said, if you're gonna be successful at directly marketing your fiber, you'll need to have an awareness of that market as well and of that product so that you can answer questions and provide a clean product that people will want to buy. Marketing of your goat meat may or may not be difficult, depending on your area. So if there's a lot of, um, goat is one of those meats that is, can fit into some ethnic niche markets, but if that, those groups of ethnic folks don't live in your area, then you wouldn't have a market in your area. So really do some research before you think, oh, I'm kind of going to meet goats, um, unless you want to eat a lot of meat goat meat yourself when you don't find a market for it. We start to think about different predators when we get to the larger livestock, but the larger livestock are also vulnerable to predators. So sheep, sheep and goats are similar, raising sheep for meat fiber or breeding stock. And I suppose some people have pet sheep and pet goats as well, that's not on there, but just like the rabbits, they could be pets. Similar to, to the goats, sheep have multiple births and a fast turnaround time, also reaching market weight between six and eight months of age on mother's milk and good pasture. So one of the struggles during the COVID-19 in the lamb market has been um, a market for the wool and for the meat. The restaurants are a really big market for lamb meat. And so you would want to really think through what your market is gonna be. In a, in a normal year, it could be more popular than goat meat, but you just don't know, you wanna, wanna look into some of those things before you get super serious about it. And same with the fiber being sold to local spinners. And if you ever wanna to talk to somebody about doing that, our own very own Kate Painter was, did that with her sheep flock a few years back, which I think is just so cool. I wanna be like Kate when I grow up. Some cons of sheep, raising sheep, also important to have good fencing and they can um, also be trained to respect that electric fence. And then having knowledge of the, the fiber market 
And so this picture at the bottom here has um, some of the guard dogs that are pretty important when you're, depending on your grazing um, area, you know, if you're grazing up in the, in the, in the forest lands, if you're grazing in your backyard, maybe you wouldn't need a guard dog, but just you would know best what's really important and what's around your area. We, like two days after we got our chickens, the coyote showed up and how they knew we had chickens, I don't know, but they just figure it out somehow. So those predators, you gotta try to be smarter than them. Not very many people in our um, entry survey talked about that they wanted pigs. So I um, won't spend any more time on pigs than I'm spending on anything else, but just to think about what are the options for pigs. Um, pigs are very prolific as well. And you, their gestation is short enough and they, you could have two litters of pigs a year, piglets a year, if you were really focused on producing piglets. And similar turnaround time as far as reaching market weight. Really kind of cool thing about pigs is that you can supplement their diet with all kinds of things. So say if you have dairy goats on your, on your small acreage and you're not able to sell all your milk, but you don't want it to go to waste, you don't know what to do with it, you could feed it to your pigs. Uh, if you have excess produce or produce that got eaten by, half eaten by bugs and you don't feel like you could sell it or want to eat it yourself, you could feed it to your pigs. So they, they could really help you know, close the gap on some of those waste streams. On the, on the small acreage. Pork is also a popular meat and you can raise pigs in a variety of uh, housing settings. You can put them in small pens, but they can also thrive on pastures and even rough ground that's not suitable to grow anything else. Going along with that though, pigs are notorious for being um, rooters, vigorous rooters and diggers. And so they will eat all the plants and all the roots and destroy the pasture if you don't manage their movement in a pasture. So that can also be a plus. My parents, uh, my parents property, there was a overgrown place of um, locust trees and there was all these little bitty stumps. They cut off all the trees, but now there's still the stumps. And I told my dad that he should get some pigs and the pigs would just clear all that out for him. He wouldn't have to try to dig them out and break his back trying to get it all done himself. One of the pretty major things to consider with pigs is the fact that they can chill and overheat easily. And you have to have shelter for pigs year round. They need to be able to be bedded warm in the winter and have adequate shade in the summer. They aren't able to sweat. And so you see people with pigs, you know, the quintessential pig pen has the big waller in it where the pig's covered in mud and it looks really messy and stinky. And really pigs really like to be clean animals, but they need that mud, they need that water to be able to cool themselves in the heat. And pigs also are susceptible to sunburn, so if you live in a really sunny area or don't have a lot of cover or aren't able to provide shade adequately, you might think about not getting pink pigs, like getting a darker colored pig because they could, uh, they don't sunburn as easily. And the largest species that we'll talk about today, um, raising cattle for beef, dairy, or breeding stock. So I didn't say, like, if I had to pick one animal, which would be really hard to pick one animal, one livestock species, I have always wanted a pet cow. Just wanted a pet cow, a cow that I didn't have to sell, a cow that I didn't care. I got a little bit excited about fiber goats for a minute because I was like, I just have to shear them. I don't have to eat them. I don't have to sell them. They just make the, make the fiber and that's the product. Anyway, so if I had to pick, I would pick cows. I love cows. Um, Beef breeds, uh, they can also be versatile, right? You don't have to finish them on a grain. If you have access to good pasture, they can reach market weight on good pasture alone. And there's some great data, again, um, that we have that uh, within extension, if you, if you wanna know how to, what costs are involved in raising these different animals, helping put a budget together, understanding, okay, if I have pasture, is it enough? Those are all kinds of things that we can help you figure out for your small acreage. And same with dairy cattle, you think about big dairies, well, they're all in confinement and they're feeding them all this crazy amounts of grain and things. And it, they don't have to be raised on grain either. They can produce excellent milk with little to no grain. There's a great market for grass-fed, grass-finished beef, milk, and cheese. And as far as fencing, barbed wire fence can work, but also uh, cows can, can also respect a hot fence being able to, um, when you have 
low stress uh, livestock handling practices and you practice working with them in, in calm, slow ways, they, they are able to be pretty docile and respect a hot fence. And of course, they're pretty hardy and self-sufficient. So big cons to these larger livestock is it's gonna take a long time for your finished product, uh, except for meat, for your meat finished product. So it's the, the cow is pregnant for 11 months and then most often there's only single babies and it takes a whole another year and a half to two years for you to actually be able to harvest that product. So two and a half to three years from breeding to harvest is a pretty significant investment of time and resources. And it's really important that you have sturdy facilities and handling equipment. These animals can range anywhere from, you know, 800 to 1500 pounds, depending on the, the breed and what you have going on, if you're gonna own a bull, all of those kind of things. So being able to have the right equipment and the right facilities is really important for you to, for you to be safe and for the animals to be safe and healthy as well. Dairy operations, just like in the goats we talked about earlier, making sure that you have the ability to clean your product, clean your facilities in a way to meet the legal requirements to market that those dairy products. And of course, you have to have quite a bit of land to be doing raising cattle at a scale, um, at a larger scale. So going back to the, in general, the things that we're gonna look at, you know, we talked about with all these species, we talked about space, we talked about um, maybe some equipment, uh, not too much in depth, but thinking things about like corrals and pens and fences and a truck and trailer. Are you gonna haul your livestock in the back of your car? How are you gonna get it home? How are you gonna haul the feed? Uh, those kind of things are all encompassing in, so you wanna get livestock. But other things to think about too are, what's the cost to start up related to what's the cost that I can generate? You know, I inherited chickens from my, from my family member. Now I have eggs to sell. So my startup cost was relatively low. Now I have my feed costs. And so what can I sell my, my eggs for? Also matching your time and your labor resources. Do you have a whole pile of kids at home that can help wrangle critters? Uh, do you, uh, when you need to vaccinate, do you have uh, enough time or are you healthy enough to be able to move the chickens every day? Do you have, are you working full time and you can't do those kind of things? So think first about what you have the capacity to do before you bring this animal into the equation. And can it complement your other enterprises? So that, okay, if I'm already raising a garden, I have this produce, I'm gonna have waste, so why not just feed it to my livestock, feed it to my pigs? If those things go together, I won't have, it just creates a closed loop in my system. Marketability is a really important thing to consider before you get the livestock, unless you're ready to assume all responsibility. So you buy 100 chickens without knowing where you're going to sell the meat or the eggs or whatever you're working on with the chickens. Um, do you have freezer space for 100, 100 chickens at the end of their season if you don't find a market? And lastly, you want it to be profitable. It's really easy to sink a lot of money into a small acreage and not come out with anything but companionship. And sometimes that's okay, uh, but a lot of times there's a lot of benefits. There's tax benefits, there's just that self-sufficiency benefit to know that, wow, I raised that and somebody bought it. That was pretty cool. And of course you wanna be, have animals that you like being around. And that's a, not a very hard sell for me because I like to be around all kinds of animals. But think about that. If you don't love pigs, don't buy pigs. If you think llamas are stinky, or they spit on you and you have all this, you know, negative thoughts about llamas, don't get llamas. You want to have a mutually, um, a relationship that can be mutually beneficial. Um, I want to, as you're thinking about your questions or typing them in, I, I want to show, so I had, I sent Mackenzie a, a handout. And I don't have it up. Um, because I put together some information about space requirements, but I didn't want to cover it too heavily because it's just, it's just numbers. So I, I, I feel like you could, um, 
read through it yourself. So this is a, a handout that goes through the different species of livestock that we talked about today and talks about how much space you need and how much shelter you need for the different types of animals. So this is going to be shared on the um, class website. And just as for, for your information, say you want to get into sheep and goats. If I have five sheep, how big does my area need to be? What kind of shelter um, for poultry, swine, rabbits? And I think that is pretty helpful. The other thing that's included in this handout is something called body condition scoring. And this is related to, I like to teach about some basics of animal husbandry. How do you know if your animals are healthy? One of the things that you can tell if your animals are healthy is how much um, fat cover they're carrying on their body. And it can be affected by lots of different things. There could be internal parasites that affect this. It could be the amount of grass, like, you know, the nutrition you're having. Have you vaccinated them recently? And so the, the rest of these just talk through um, what, is a, what is a healthy cow look like when it comes to fat cover on their body. And um, there's also a chart for sheep and a chart for pigs. And a chart for horses, even though we didn't talk about horses, but fat horses, overly fat horses aren't healthy horses either. So this will be a resource that will be in your, in your handouts, as well as the slides that I shared today. Okay, what kind of questions? So I see that there's a question in the Q&A box about um, in Butte County, what should we plant in our waterless pasture to graze cattle, goats, donkeys, and chickens? That's a great question. And I, I would welcome any of any from Samantha or Kate to also, or Jen to also chime in about um, any of these questions. You would, you, waterless pasture, so you know that you, know, you don't have, you don't have the ability to irrigate. After I'm done speaking, I'm happy to type a list of um, grasses into the question and answer box. Perfect. So I know um, Samantha's going to jump into rotational grazing here in a second. Okay. Any other questions? I haven't looked at the chat. Um, Oh, Diane's going to have a giraffe. I love it. I didn't see that we had any other questions that came through the chat, Rebecca. Okay, great. So either I told you things you already knew or um, the or you're already excited about what you're what you're going to do. I have a couple a couple more minutes before Samantha takes over, so I might ask a few questions of you all in the put in the chat so um is there from from what you <clears throat> commented on early in the class of what kind of um, enterprises you're interested in are there any that surprised you in the information i shared today about things you might consider now knowing how they might connect to other things you have going on rebecca you have a few more questions do you want me to read oh. them to you i see them coming in okay okay so we got cohabitating, uses for donkeys, and best place to look for purchasing your a few cows or steers. Okay. So cohabitating, um, and any of anybody can jump in too. I'm not the, I'm not the expert on all of these things, but I like to find the resources. I'm thinking about uh, how I mentioned how um, if you're grazing cattle in a pasture or sheep in a pasture, to be able to have the chickens go through after that. There's also thinking about different species of birds being able to live together. Some of the cohabitating things you need to consider is what kind of um, parasites might be shared back and forth. Or diseases. I actually yeah. lost a steer that I was raising when I was raising a lot of lambs because there was, there's a really awful disease that is shedded by um, lambs by, and that the, my steer picked up and I um, it was one of the reasons they had, they had a big, uh, they had to separate those two species at the state fair in Washington. 
I can't think of the name. It's a really long name, but um, there is some disease problems from actually cohabitating. Right. But the idea of following one from the other is is really good. Yeah, it's probably more, um, you think, oh, I'll just turn them all out in the same pasture together. But you really do want to think through some of those things um, that they can be interdependent, but not cohabitate. So they can benefit each other, like parasite control, chickens following pig, or following um, following cattle. But yeah, like the being able to share cross cross-species diseases, you wouldn't want to... And there's probably lots of those, and I'm not a, a trained veterinarian to know all the different things. Um, okay, uses for donkeys. Donkeys can also be a guard animal for other livestock. Um, I've uh, same with llamas. So they they're more of a companion animal for some of your other livestock. And you can raise them as breeding stock. I mean the to be able to sell mini, like say if it was a mini donkey, it could be a guard animal for smaller, like say smaller goats. You could have a, a donkey that could drive off some, they could be kind of, um, what's the word? The boss of the pasture. And then you could sell mini donkeys to other people who think they're beautiful, friendly little pasture animals. And, um, the best place to purchase your first cows or steers. There's probably as many opinions on that as there are people buying and selling cows and steers. There's obviously play, people selling them on um, online in Facebook groups, on in Craigslist, all the kind of online marketing. But there's also, if you happen to know um, a, a rancher, if you have a neighbor that raises cattle, then that could be a really great place to start for a few different reasons. One, you, you have a connection with the buyer, or with the seller, so that you can go back to them and say, hi, I'm having this trouble with this animal you sold me. Can you teach me what's, what's going on? And they will, they will know. They, like, so we bought our first heifers from a, the guy who leases our property to graze his cattle on in the spring. And he can tell us their life history. He knows how, uh, who their mothers were, who their, who the, sires were back 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 generations and he by establishing that connection we were able to know their vaccination history we were able to know a lot about them so creating a relationship with who you're buying your animals from could be really beneficial in that way any other comments smith or kate about any of those other questions um i would tend to agree with um buying livestock from reputable breeders in your area because they are a great resource and a lot of times if you go to um, a sale on the weekend you can find good livestock um, but there's keep in mind there's a reason that animal is there there's a reason that they took it to the sale yard um, instead of selling it to somebody personally I and mean, it's not always bad um, it could just be that they can't have you know 20 head of cows this year so they're getting rid of three of them um, but a lot of times it'll be you know the cow's not producing enough milk so they take her to the sale or something so keep that in mind that there's a reason that the ones at the sale are being sold and a lot of times that's the same for craigslist as well yeah i bought some sheep and uh because i was trying to buy ones that somebody else was you know that they were culling and even though it was from a breeder the ones who were culling one of them brought uh, foot rot into my my farm mm. and that was an incredibly uh, expensive uh, problem <laughs> and labor intensive so uh, yeah reputable <laughs> thank you for doing that yeah and I uh, there's a couple of comments in the chat about uh, that Dexter's having a shorter gestation you know that's true like it is not, I think my slide must have been incorrect because it said, it said 11 months for cattle, didn't it? And it is nine, nine and a half months. I will have to go back and fix that. <laughs> um, and donkeys having a difficult, donkeys are very different than horses and, if, and mules are different than horses. And so um, thinking of, you have to know what, what you're bringing home and what you're getting yourself into when it comes to the care of that animal not just think oh well I've had this kind of 
equine before I can, it's the same for the others, absolutely. Okay, I'm at 10.45 and pass it to Samantha. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. You did an amazing job.